So next up, we have a video recorded presentation by Debbie Langenfeld. Uh, Debbie was in Iceland uh, or is in Iceland um, uh, during the making of this. And so he went ahead and put that together, uh, which is wonderful. Debbie has been a steward for seven years and has been involved in almost all of our citizen science projects and has held a number of leadership roles in the program. She served as citizen science chair for three years and has led our BAT project and co-leads our restoration projects with Jane Brady. Debbie wishes that she could join us today, but she is clearly out, it says out of town here in Iceland, a little bit out of town. Uh, so please enjoy this recorded presentation and we will take questions afterwards. We'll do our best to answer them as a group. Hello, everybody. Jane Brady and I are the citizen science leads for the restoration projects. We're really enjoying working with Helen and Mary, our research partners from Northern Arizona University and the city of Scottsdale on several different kinds of research projects. But before we get started talking about those projects, first let's do a quick review of what ecological restoration is. Well, it's about helping damaged areas recover to a natural state, but it's also about improving ecosystem functioning and resilience so the area can survive in the future to meet the challenges of climate change and urbanization. Success is largely dependent on the ability to grow native plants. So knowing how to grow them in a controlled environment, such as a greenhouse, is one thing. But growing them in a natural setting, such as the arid southwest, is quite a different thing. In order to transform the landscape from the picture on the left to that beautiful picture on the right, requires some assistance from us. And just like anything else, we need to learn how to do it. So let's take a look at what we've been up to in the past year that has helped us move our knowledge forward. This year marked the conclusion of a majority of our collaboration with USGS and the RestoreNet Research Project. This project seeks to identify the best restoration treatments across different arid landscapes. USGS has sites in California, along the Colorado Plateau, Southeast Arizona, New Mexico, and the one circled in blue are the four that we've been working with them on. We installed research plots in our four locations in 2019. There's one at Lake Pleasant, one in Tonto National Forest, one at Scottsdale Community College, and one in the preserve close to the Granite Mountain Trailhead. We're experimenting with four treatments, mulch, digging pits for water retention, warm and cool seed mixes, and con mods. Now con mods are wire mesh structures that act as nursery for plants to grow. Results indicate that what's performed the best are the pit treatments and the cool seed mixes. Cool seed mixes are seeds that germinate following the winter rains and include spring flowers like the lupins and chia. Starting in the summer fall of 2022, which is pretty much now, we will be a part of RestoreNet 2.0 at the preserve site only. We'll be installing new restoration treatments, such as topsoil transfers, bringing the seed bank from under nearby trees and bushes and shrubs into the degraded site and adding inoculated seed balls to the plots. Shifting gears and moving on to another project. One of the Parsons Field Institute top goals is to develop best practices for the restoration of degraded areas in the preserve and also other arid lands. The point of this pilot project is to take what treatments we've been working that have been working best from our previous project and test them on a small scale. This will help us start scaling to larger restoration sites in the preserve. This is both a research and implementation site. We're experimenting with four different treatments, litter or debris, adding seed bank, 
biocrust, and succulent transplanting. This summer, we'll have to start gearing up because we anticipate adding three additional sites later this year. We've been working on a biocrust restoration project since 2018 with NAU research partner Anita Antonica. Biocrust in the Southwest is made up of a community of three organisms, lichen, cyanobacteria, and mosses. It's often overlooked as a treatment, which is really interesting because it has incredible benefits that would help aid in restoration efforts. The most important one is erosion control. It holds the soil together by acting as a skin. Other benefits include nutrition recycling and moisture retention. What could be better if you're trying to grow plants than to add something in the mix that helps you do it? Because of human-driven activities such as urbanization and farming, it's disappearing rapidly. While there are development standards and requirements to save some species of trees and cactus, such as the saguaro, it's sad to say, and I'm sad to say, that currently there aren't any for for requirements for salvaging biocrust. The point of this research is twofold. First, determining if biocrust can be grown, and second, seeing if it will establish in the field. So you might ask yourself, well, why do we have to grow it? Well, because of its incredible benefits, we don't want to dig it up from one place and transplant it to another. That would be defeating the purpose. Using biocrust salvage from the Fraserville Trailhead, in 2019, we determined we can successfully grow it. That year, we laid down 222 research plots at Granite Mountain to test if the grown biocrust will establish itself in the field. Experiments are still ongoing, and we anticipate having one more data survey in the fall, so the results from these studies are not yet published. That brings us to a project that we're very excited about. The work on biocrust attracted the attention of Bridget Barker, also from NAU. And just like Anita Antoinica is an expert in biocrust, Bridget is an expert in everything valley fever. She helps to determine if the soil stability provided by biocrust could suppress cocci, the fun fungus associated with valley fever. As you know, the fungus are endemic to the southwest, with highest prevalence in Southern California and Southern Arizona. This is leading edge research. To date, no one has attempted to address valley fever through environmental remediation and restoration of natural soil communities. So the question is, can biocrust be used to reduce the existence of airborne cocky or valley fever? Well, just like the research on biocrust, the results aren't in yet. But with the preliminary data the researchers have, it's encouraging to see that they are seeing negative results from samples pulled near the biocrust plots. Negative meaning that cocky is not, is not present in those samples. However, it's way too early and further collections need to be taken and analyzed to ensure that these sites remain negative. And I have to stress that this is very preliminary data. More work needs to be done to determine the relationship between valley fever and biocrust. That's a very quick overview of what we've been up to in the 2021-2022 season. Looking to the future, we're positioned quite well to further our knowledge and to continue to contribute to the existing body of knowledge concerning best practice management of degraded lands. The research has paved the way for those working on future projects where biocrust might be used to improve environmental and human health. And we have loads of stored preserved biocrust that we collected at Pima Dynamite that can be used for further research projects. I want to acknowledge all of our partners and citizen scientists who have helped make this research possible and especially my co-lead, Jane Brady, who has been just absolutely terrific to work with. Thank you very much for your time today.
Well, we have a couple questions. What one question is what is the time frame needed to grow biocrust? I'm not sure that we have the answer to that question yet. I think we are we are really trying to figure it out. Mary, would you like to talk a little bit about the experiment? Yeah, and I see Helen has unmuted herself too. So uh, feel free to jump in, Helen. But yeah, that's that's one of the things that we're trying to do is speed up uh, the process of the time frame to grow biocrust. So um, when we grew out the crusts at um, Scottsdale Community College and the different treatments, you can grow that out in about three months. And so you can augment um, what you've gotten from the field. And then from there, um, uh, moving it into the field, that's the part that's uh, less well known. Um, we've been, uh, we have in our field experiment, we've looked at, um, we've sort of been looking at ways of helping it um, stabilize in those plots. And we've also looked at um, transplanting it with, uh, we grew it on jute and so grow, moving that and so variations on that. So those were the two main experiments. Um, and we're in third year, yeah. is that right? Third, third year. Yeah, and so, um, hi Jane. Jane might have more to add too. <laughs> um, and so it has been, um, established, but um, it doesn't, you know, it's not growing very fast out in the field. It grows fast in the three months when you're watering it every day. Okay. I understand there are different types of bio crust in different environments. For example, Utah versus Phoenix, et cetera. I assume we're just dealing with one type of biocrust in the preserve, or does the biocrust vary depending on the environment? I think the composition varies, but I don't know what would constitute a type, you know, one from another. Well, we went to a conference uh, at the beginning of our work in 2019 where uh, the researchers were talking about differences in the, uh, in the community that makes up biocrust in different parts of the country. And so it does vary. And uh, we pulled the biocrust that we're working with from uh, projects around the preserve. So uh, we localized it that way. And one thing that I think has been interesting in talking to uh, Anita, our research partner, is that, uh, and Jane and, and uh, Helen and uh, Debbie, is that the composition of the makeup of what's in the biocrust and what's successful changes when you uh, grow it out in the greenhouse. Like for instance, uh, it's mossier. If you grow it in the greenhouse, than it would be if you uh, if it was growing on its own in the preserve. So that comes in faster than it would uh, typically uh, growing naturally outside. So those are some uh, characteristics of the work that we've been doing and finding out um, what that means when it's put back out into the field. Well, that, that exhausts the available questions. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you. Excellent. And thank you to, uh, to Debbie, although she's not here, and to Jane for her help putting that together, and uh, Mary for making it all work.